Hey, what's up, guys? Okay, so before I even delve into what happened in this week's chapter, I actually want to quickly go over the anime real quick for Black Clover because this week's newest episode actually finished up the trial of Asta. And well, I'm actually very excited to see how far the anime has come, especially since I believe when it was initially announced, it was only supposed to be about like a 55 episode, I think 50 something episode season, ending right before I believe the Witch Force arc. And to see the fact that it actually ended up getting an extension from that and then continue on to the point where we're at now. It's really exciting. I'm actually see, glad to see how popular Black Clover has come, become in the anime world. But at the same time, I'm a little bit afraid or a little bit scared about how closely the anime has caught up to where the manga is. Because, alright, episode 122 of the anime, which is what this week's episode was, covers the content of chapters 218 to about halfway through chapter 220 of the manga. Keep in mind, with this week's newest chapter, we're only just now getting to chapter 240. So that's about two and a half chapters worth of content in one episode. So if it keeps up at this pace, that means within the next nine to ten weeks, we would have caught up to where we are currently with this week's chapter in the anime. Assuming that Tabata doesn't take any breaks, that means we will only be about ten chapters ahead in the manga to where the anime is. So you see what the problem is, right? We are so close in the anime to where the manga is, that we're getting to the point where either the anime is going to have to take a long hiatus or it's going to have to go into a filler arc. And one thing I've enjoyed about the Black Clover anime up to this point is that it has pretty much, for the most part, just followed the story of the manga, not really delved too much into filler. And I would really hate to see it delve into a filler arc, especially because of the fact that even though I, again, enjoyed Black Clover anime, it's not really that well received amongst anime viewers. And with the way people reacted to Bleach, One Piece, and Naruto, the big three, when they would enter the film arcs, I honestly don't see the anime doing well or even at all being received well if they were to delve into a long film arc like they would. Now, that being said, the Black Clover anime actually has a rare opportunity that they can actually throw in a film arc and actually still make it seem like it's actually part of the canon story. And that's because of the fact that, as we manga readers know, we're quickly getting to the point where Asta, Noel, and a bunch of them actually decide to go over to the Heart Kingdom and train over there for about six months in order to defeat Megakuo in the Spade Kingdom. But we already know in the ma as manga readers that we don't actually get to see any of that training. We go from one chapter where they decide to do the training to the next chapter being the time skip. But anime viewers who only watch the anime don't know that that happened. So we have a rare opportunity where after they decide to do the six months of training in one episode, we could then go into a field arc where we actually see these characters do the training in the Heart Kingdom and this would actually make it seem like for anyone who just reads the an or watches the anime, seem like it's actually canon, while giving us manga readers something that we actually wanted to see, them actually doing their training during the six months period. Anyway guys, enough about the anime, let's just jump right into what happened in this week's chapter, and the chapter actually opens up with Lord Pachika, Charmy, Noel, Mimosa, and Gaja, yeah Gaja, all inside Lord Pachika's kind of like observation room, and we actually just get to see the four girls kind of just enjoying themselves, having fun. And really this beginning part of the chapter is really supposed to be kind of like the calm before the storm. Because after this point, the chapter goes from 0 to 100 very quickly. And actually, we'll know there actually is one other point where we actually get to see like another calm before the storm moment. But still, this is the opening part is supposed to be like the calm before the storm in the heart kingdom. Anyway, we get this opening scene. And again, it's supposed to be like the calm before the storm. But it also kind of serves to give us a hint as to what kind of backstory or critique is going to end up having. Because we get these two panels at the end of the page where we actually get to see Gaja. He's just kind of just like observing her, like what's going on with them. And we get a hint of him smiling, which by the way, I think is the first time we actually get to see him have anything besides that stone cold face since his introduction. But anyway, he's smiling and he's looking at Laura Pachika enjoying herself. And I think these two panels are kind of hinting at the idea that Laura Pachika most likely didn't really have that many friends growing up or was really kind of a loner. And then, and Gaja didn't really get to see her enjoying herself the way she is in this chapter that much throughout her entire life. Because keep in mind, Laura Pratik is only 21 right now. Which means that she most likely took on the throne at a very early age. And she had a curse placed on her probably at a very early age as well. Which means that she most likely throughout most of her childhood didn't actually get to have a lot of fun. Which is actually kind of a staple for a lot of manga and anime royal characters who actually do have to take on the throne at a very early age. They usually don't get to actually grow up and have a real childhood. So the fact that he actually knows that she didn't really have that many friends growing up and probably didn't really get to have that many chances of actual enjoyment and fun 
seeing her in this moment actually enjoying herself wholeheartedly is probably enough to actually soften up Gaja's stone heart. And you know what? This first page and what Tabata is making me infer from it alone is making me even more excited for when we eventually get Lord Ratika's backstory in a flashback. Because I'm excited to see exactly what ended up happening to her parents, why she ended up taking on the throne at such an early age, and exactly when she got the curse. I'm assuming again it was at a very young age, and if I had to guess as to what Lord Ratika's backstory most likely is, in fact, you know, I'm just going to draw my theory right now. I'm going to guess that at a very, very early age, probably around the same time that Yuno's parents were killed off when the Dark Triad took over the Spade Kingdom, probably given like a maybe a year or two after that, I'm going to guess that the Dark Triad actually tried to take over the Heart Kingdom. They managed to somehow kill the king and queen or whoever Lord Pratika's parents were and were ultimately thwarted by Yuno dying from taking over the Heart Kingdom. So, in an attempt to make sure that they would be able to take over the Heart Kingdom eventually in the future, they had Mega Kuko place the curse on uh, Lord Pratinko. That way, either A, in the future, they will get to the point where they're strong enough to just kill her outright, or B, Lord Pratinko just ends up dying from the curse, which will give them the opportunity to actually go in and take over the Heart Kingdom anyway, because of the fact that once she's dead, there will be no one for Udai to be contracted to, which means that she won't be there to protect the Heart Kingdom anymore, giving them the opportunity to go in there and actually eventually take it over by themselves. But anyway guys, like I said, this first page was just the calm before the storm, because immediately as soon as the second page starts up, Lord Pachika picks up on the fact that there are six people with devil powers surrounding the Heart Kingdom, and she finds out that, that Vanica is actually one of the people leading the charge on this invasion. Now. Interestingly enough, we actually get to see Vanica and we get to see a silhouette of the demon she's contracted to. And for one, it's completely different from the demon that Xenon was contracted to when we saw him in chapter 238. So that kind of confirms the theory that basically each one of the Dark Triads and most likely each person in the Spade Kingdom army who is contracted to a demon has a different demon that they're contracted to. But not only that, the fact that we know that because of what uh, Lord Pratika says in this chapter, that the demon that she has with her is Megikulo, this kind of confirms that Megikulo actually isn't the big threat that we all thought he was going to be. And the reason why this confirms it is because of the fact that we all know that Dante is the leader of the Dark Triad, which means that he's most likely going to be the big threat of the entire arc. And if each one of them is contracted to a different demon, and Vanica is the one who has Megikulo, that means whatever demon that Dante is actually contracted to is actually the one who is the big threat, and we still have no idea who that demon is. Now, after what happened to Yuno in the recent chapters, a lot of people have been debating whether or not Ast actually is stronger than Yuno at this point, and if basically Yuno not going to the Heart Kingdom for that six months to train has put him behind any of the characters who actually did go over there. And I actually think that this little fight that we're actually going to get to see is going to be an indicator of whether or not Asta and the other characters who trained over in the Heart Kingdom for the six months actually have surpassed Yuno at this point. Because right now, in the Heart Kingdom, we already know for sure that we have Charmy, Mimosa, Noel, Warpachiko, and Gaja. That's five characters to fight off against five of the people who are invading the Heart Kingdom. Now, obviously, Warpachiko is not going to end up fighting herself, so that takes away and brings it out to four. Then we can think about the fact that, Mer uh, that uh, Mimosa is mostly a support character. She's not really a fighter herself, you know, she does have some powerful attack spells, so she's most likely not going to be fighting herself either. Which means we're down to three characters, Charmy, Noel, and Gaja. But we also know that the last time we saw them, Luck, Leo, and Ryo were all in the Heart Kingdom as well. Which means that those three will actually end up joining in the fight as well. So that puts six characters to fight off against the six characters that are invading the Heart Kingdom. So now that we know that six of the people who actually did train in the Heart Kingdom for these six months will be fighting off against these other six characters. We are actually going to get a clear indication, assuming that each of the people that Vanica brought over can use at least 40% of the demon's power, like the Dark Apostles that Yuno fought off against did, then we'll get a clear indication exactly where their power levels are compared to Yuno. And you know what, that's all I'm going to say on the topic, I'm not really going to sit here and debate whether or not I think any of these characters actually are stronger than what Yuno was when we actually saw him fight a few chapters ago. I'm just going to let the manga speak for herself. But anyway, we cut over from them over to the Black Bull headquarters, which we end up finding out is actually on like the border of the Spade Kingdom. So I guess I guess the Black Bulls are kinda like keep it, are kinda in charge of like watching the movements of the Spade Kingdom, seeing exactly what's going on there. That's the only reason I could think of why they would put their headquarters so close to the Spade Kingdom their their current threat. But anyway, they're all kinda just hanging out there. We end up finding out that Yami and 
Gouch, or no, Yami and Gordon currently are there. Yami, because of the fact that he is in a meeting in the Clover Kingdom. In fact, Finral actually ends up going to pick him up, so he's out of there for right now. And uh, Gordon is currently training on how to use his curse magic in different ways with his family. So right now at the Blackpool headquarters, there is Asta, Vanessa, Ray, Gouch, and uh, Henry, and Henry. Because of the fact that also Magna and Zora aren't there because they're out hanging out. Because apparently during the six month period, the two of them actually became very close friends and just kind of like hang out now apparently. But anyway, these characters are kind of just like hanging out at the Blackpool headquarters and in the middle of their conversation, Henry wakes up because he's been asleep right now because he's trying to conserve as much energy as he can since uh, Charmy's not there to replenish him all the time. He doesn't want to constantly suck out the magic from everyone else. So he's kind of just sleeping. And in the middle of their conversation while he's sleeping, he wakes up, interrupts their conversation because of the fact that he realizes that they're under attack. And this is when we actually see Dante is there and he's actually lifting up the entire Black Bull headquarters in the air. And this is actually one of those moments where Vanessa gets to save the day because once Dante realizes that Yami's not actually there, he decides to just have some fun and tries to crush the Black Bull headquarters with everyone inside. But Rogue is actually able to cancel him out. And basically once he realizes that what she did, he realizes that obviously Yami's not the only arcane stage mage. And he gets kind of like this evil look on his face, kind of indicating that he's probably going to go after her as well now. Now obviously once he realizes they're under attack, the Black Bull's immediately going to the offensive. We actually get to see Henry transform the base into his giant mech form because obviously that's how he fights. And he actually goes to throw a punch at Dante and we actually get to see kind of this like interesting combination magic between him and Gouch where Gouch uses his mirror magic to somehow enhance the power of the punch. Not exactly sure how that works. Can't wait to see it animated so I can get a clear understanding of what he was doing. But anyway, the attack doesn't end up working because Dante somehow blocks it. Again, I'm not, exact, I'm not exactly sure how he blocked it because the way it was drawn doesn't really indicate exactly what he did, or at least from my memory it doesn't. I have to go back and look. But anyway, once he blocks the attack, we end up finding out that he uses gravitation magic. And I'm actually really interested to see exactly how his gravitation magic works with his demon powers. Because we got to see exactly how the Zeno, Zeno uses his demon powers to enhance his bone magic. And I'm sure we're going to get to see whatever Vanica's magic is, exactly how her demon powers uh, enhance that. But when it comes to Dante's gravitation powers, I can't exactly see any way demonic powers on top of that would enhance it besides making its gravitation even stronger. Like if he's using his gravitational magic to put pressure on someone and make them fall to the ground, the only thing I can see is demon powers enhancing is basically how much pressure the gravitation is putting on that person. So I'm interested in seeing exactly what the body comes up with for this. And then the chapter pretty much ends the way we all expected it to with Asta charging headfirst into a fight against Dante. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that Asta is about to lose this fight. There's no way, no matter how much training Asta did during that six month period, there's no way he's powerful enough to take on Dante alone when he's fighting at full strength. Even with the rest of the White Bulls backing him up, or at least the ones that he is currently with him, I don't think he realistically stands a chance when Dante uses all the power he can from the demonic power that he has. That being said, I'm actually really interested in seeing what the result after this fight's going to be. Because I think just like how Asta learned new ways to use his swords when he was actually watching him lick fight and that inspired him to gain a new power, I think once he actually ends up fighting against Dante and seeing how Dante, someone with a similar ability that he has, uses his demonic powers, it's going to inspire Asta to find new ways to use his own demonic powers to give him another power boost during this arc. Anyway guys, that's pretty much it for the chapter. I'm excited to see, most of all, this fight between Asta, the Black Bulls, and Dante. Just because of the fact that I'm interested in seeing what happens once Yami comes into the mix. Because obviously since the fact that we actually set up Finral going to get Yami ahead of time, we know that eventually they're going to come back to the Black Bulls base. And once they do, Yami's going to jump into the fight. And I'm going to be interested to see if Yami, plus Asta, plus the rest of the Black Bulls, are strong enough altogether to push Dante back to where he has to retreat. Or if they do end up defeating him and taking Yami and possibly Vanessa along with him. But like I say, guys, that's it for the chapter. That's it for the review. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, drop me a like, subscribe to the channel. I would greatly appreciate it. Comment down below with your thoughts and theories. And I'll catch you guys next week. Peace.